Hello, everyone. I hope you're all staying safe and taking good care of yourself. My name is Arik Bal, and on behalf of DBT, Welcome Trust India Alliance, and European Molecular Biology Organization, I welcome you all to this webinar on India and Molecular Courses. Uh, we would all agree that science progresses through constant learning, exchange, and creation of new ideas. And for this reason, scientific conferences, events, and workshops play a very important role in shaping the career of a young researcher. In line with this idea, the science funding charity DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance, or India Alliance for short, and European Molecular Biology Organization, EMBO, launched a unique program in India last year to fund six lecture courses in life sciences that are specially designed to address the learning and training needs of PhD students and postdocs in India. The call for application for the third round is currently open, and we bring this webinar to you to help you prepare a strong funding application to organize an India EMBO lecture course uh, for this round or uh, in the future rounds. So to talk about this unique partnership, uh, the application process, the funding criteria, and the recipe for a fundable, uh, fundable application, we are joined today by the CEO of India Alliance, Dr. Vasan Sambandamurti, Deputy Director of EMBO, uh, Gerland Wallen, uh, EMBO Course Committee Chair, Zoe Liguru, from University of Petras, Greece, organizer of EMBO Feb's lecture course Stephen Kless from University of Copenhagen, Denmark, and last but not the least, Shubha Tole from TIFR, Mumbai, uh, organizer of India Ambo lecture course uh, recently awarded. A warm welcome to all, uh, all of you, uh, and thank you uh, very much for joining us today. Uh, before we uh, dive into the webinar, a few housekeeping announcements to ensure that today's webinar runs smoothly. Due to certain uh, logistical limitations, uh, video and microphone of the attendees will remain switched off. So we request you to please drop your questions and comments at any time in the question box, which is indicated here by the arrow. Uh, please also make sure that your questions only pertain to the topics of today's webinar. And while we will try our very best to respond to all the questions that you share during this webinar, if there are any unanswered questions, uh, please send them to us after the webinar and we will get back to you as soon as we can. The session is being recorded. Uh, the recording will be available through India Alliance YouTube channel. In case the session ends abruptly due to any technical glitch, please don't panic. Just join back using the same registration link that you received at the time of registration. And in case you plan to share any highlights from this webinar on your social media channels, do feel free to tag us and use the hashtag uh, IndiaMOLC. Uh, before we start, we would like to learn a bit about our audience today at this webinar. So I would request you to please participate in two quick polls. So please indicate uh, one of the choices here on the slide. Thank you very much for participating in, in this poll. So we have about 50% of you uh, researcher, scientist, and academia, and about 24% in other. 7% researcher, scientist, industry, 7% early uh, career researcher, and 5% postdoctoral fellows. Thank you very much for participating in this poll. Can we, can we launch the next poll, please? We would... Uh, quite like to hear from you whether you were aware of this uh, program before you joined the webinar uh, or is this the first time you're uh, hearing about it so please select uh, one of these options on the screen Great, thank you so much again for participating in, in these two polls. So looks like uh, um, our speakers will, will, uh, will help you in um, better understanding this uh, program. And so without uh, much ado, I would like to invite uh, uh, CEO of India Alliance, uh, Vasan Sambandamurthy, to introduce India Alliance and its work and say a few words about India Alliance's partnership with EMBO uh, and on this uh, very important program. So over to you, uh, Vasan. 
Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, good afternoon. A warm welcome to all the participants and the panelists for joining me on this important webinar. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, since we heard from the Paul that almost 80% of people do not know about this program, I thought I will take a couple of minutes to uh, give you a background of who we are, what we do, and why this is so important for us in terms of this partnership with EMBO. As you could see here, our main uh, aim of India Alliance, which was uh, jointly funded by the Department of Biotechnology and uh, Wellcome Trust way back in 2008, with the mandate of four core areas. One is in terms of building and strengthening uh, uh, research capacity in both biomedical as well as uh, public health research. And uh, this we aim to do via fostering interdisciplinary research, both to individuals as well as to teams via both national and international collaborations. And most importantly, we want to make science accessible. If you could have the next slide, please. To give you a quick journey of how, how where we were and where we are now, September 2008 was a catalytic partnership built by Department of Biotechnology and Wellcome Trust with an idea to really build this uh, ecosystem of uh, scientific researchers. And we started off early on uh, with our flagship fellowship program aimed at uh, identifying early, intermediate, as well as uh, senior research fellows in the area of biomedical research. The idea behind this fellowship was basically to launch, establish, and lead the, uh, 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 the uh, pathway for uh, someone to get into biomedical research. Uh, five years later in 2013, we added uh, the same fellowships outside biomedical research into clinical and public health research. Then in 2019, we thought that 10 years of uh, having funded individual researchers, we heard, uh, we got a feedback from uh, the community wherein there was a need to really uh, forge or facilitate interdisciplinary research at a much larger level. Uh, given the size of India to really address uh, a, a, a big health problem, we needed uh, people with big ideas and big institutions to participate. With that intention, we launched the Team Science Grant as well as the clinical research uh, uh, scheme in 2019. And as we speak, we are into our second phase of India Alliance. If you could have the next slide, please. As you could see that uh, we have a, a rich data in the last 10 years. And as you would see that we are spread across India, we do have a very broad pan-India footprint. Uh, we are spread across 41 cities. Uh, we have fellows operating from around 110 institutions. And uh, we have around 400 plus uh, uh, fellows uh, in our uh, who are getting a fellowship. So this is the data from early this year. And as the year ends, we will have more people and more cities and institutions participating. We really uh, have a great emphasis on diversity, gender diversity. As you could see that we are one of the unique organizations wherein almost one third of our fellows are women. And if you really look at the pie chart on the top left, it clearly shows how is a fellowship uh, kind of uh, uh, divided. Uh, a bulk of our uh, fellows are in the intermediate category, that's almost over 50%. And the, the remaining is uh, uh, split between early careers as well as uh, senior fellows. If you could have the next slide, please. Yeah, so in terms of, you know, we are very cognizant of really using the public money to uh, build this ecosystem. And we do have ears and eyes on the ground in terms of understanding our impact and uh, having metrics around outreach. So if you could divide this into four uh, important aspects, we uh, play a very important role in science communication. So we do engage the public as well as the scientific uh, uh, society via our popular science talks, which are run by our fellows, as well as other international uh, uh, leaders. We create a lot of uh, health awareness programs. We uh, convey science via art. And uh, so far, we have had around more than 10,000 participants benefited via our uh, science communication outreach. We also put a lot of emphasis on training because uh, as a country, we really need to train our scientists to think the right way and also to uh, create opportunities and awareness about what's happening around the world. So uh, through our dedicated training programs, so far, we have trained more than 3,400 PhD students. Uh, uh, across India. We also have a flagship program which really promotes uh, science media fellowships. Uh, then in terms of policy, we really uh, take a lot of emphasis or uh, we put a lot of emphasis on 
how do we translate the investment and research into policy matters? So 14 of our fellows are working on areas where we, we, uh, uh, we believe will have an impact on the policy. Until date, we have seven policies that have been implemented by Government of India, which includes diverse areas such as nutritional guidelines, tribal health, gene therapy, as well as uh, use of uh, tobacco. And we are one of these early signatories in DORA, wherein we uh, encourage our uh, fellows to publish in open access. So almost 70% of our publications uh, uh, put forward by our fellows are all open access. If you could have the next slide, please. So this brings us to another important aspect of what else do we do beyond uh, 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 awarding fellowships? We also play an important role in fostering interdisciplinary and international collaborations. And we also encourage people to create platforms, avenues and opportunities for people to share resources and knowledge. And to, in order to do this, we conduct a series of meetings, workshops, and also uh, have uh, schemes to uh, help people to travel for conferences. If I could move to the next slide, please. So as you could see that the, one of the most important thing, which is important to highlight here is the unique India Embo lecture course, what you're going to hear subsequently from the other speakers. This is a flagship program, which was initiated as a tri-party agreement between Government of India, Embo, and the European Molecular Biology Conference, with the idea of really building in partnerships and network between India and Europe. So uh, this is one of the programs. The second program, what we have done is the Africa India Mobility Fund, wherein we really encourage researchers from India to travel to Africa and vice versa, researchers from Africa to travel to India to really exchange ideas and work on uh, interdisciplinary research. If you could move to the next slide, please. Another important uh, aspect is we do fund and we are a, uh, we are a partner in the Young Investigator Meeting, which actually brings in the best talent across the country from across the globe to come and uh, have discussion and deliberation over uh, three to four days and we are happy to be a part of this so these are some of the flagship programs what i try to highlight uh, and the next slide please so uh, for more details i would really uh, encourage uh, all the participants to visit our website www.indialines.org or you can find us on the social media and we'll be very happy to take questions at the end of the session thank you so much and uh, I, I, Hand it over back to you, Sarah. Thank you, uh, Pasan, for that very helpful overview of India Alliance and its activities. Um, and next up, we I would like to invite uh, Gerland uh, Wallen, who's the Deputy Director of EMBO, to tell us about EMBO's activities in India, its collaboration with India Alliance that uh, Vasan uh, mentioned, and also about the India EMBO lecture courses. So uh, over to you, Gerland. Can you hear me? Yes, Colin. Oh, okay, thank you. Just want to make sure. Uh, just apologies first that uh, that the webcam is not working, so we'll have to make do with this. Um, well, first of all, thank you for the lead and the introduction to Vasan and Sarah. And um, I would like to welcome all of you to the well to the webinar on India Embo lecture courses, which are jointly funded by Embo and India Alliance, as Vasan pointed out. So first of all, also a big thank you to the India Alliance team for organizing this webinar. And before delving into the topic for today, I would also like to welcome our two course organizers, Shubha Thol and Stefan Pless, and the chair of the uh, EMBO course committee, Zoe Ligero. Thank you all for taking the time to discuss the lecture courses with the audience. So first, I would like to give a short introduction to EMBO and about our, our collaboration with scientists, scientists in India before talking about the lecture courses. So EMBO is the uh, European Molecular Biology Organization. Um, Gerland, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, we can't see your slides. Um, can you try to, can you try resharing your slides? Yes. Um, uh, yes, we can see the slides now. If you could just. Uh, can you see no. that? Mm, no, it's, we can't. Uh, see that. Uh, can I request my colleague to uh, share uh, Gerland's slides? Yes, please do that. Then. Uh, 
uh, just give us a minute, please. Uh, less than a minute. They just, they just, can you share the slides, uh, please? Ah, yes, could you please go to the second slide? Okay, so um, you can hear me now though, right? Yes, clearly, thank you. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so first I would like to say a few words about EMBO and how uh, scientists in India can benefit from our collaboration. So EMBO is a European Molecular Biology Organization with over 1900 leading life scientists recognized for research excellence by their peers. Next slide. So, <clears throat> EMBO members are elected annually. There are 1,800 members in Europe. They are nominated and elected by the membership. And there are 160 scientists elected as EMBO associate members. 88 of our members are Nobel laureates. Next slide. Here, just to show the EMBO members in India, it's Vijay Raghavan, Jitu Mayor, and Alice Shashidara. And of course, Indian-born Nobel laureate Benki Ramakrishnan is also an EMBO member. Next slide. EMBO Fund provides funding for training of scientists at different career stages. Next slide. We receive our funding by our intergovernmental organization, uh, EMBC, um, which is made up of 30, uh, 30 uh, European member states and four associated countries. Next slide. Um, India as the uh, largest uh, contributor, Singapore, Taiwan, and Chile. This means that uh, scientists from India are fully eligible to our programs, about which I will be talking in uh, a few seconds. Next slide, please. Um, EMBO is also involved in, in science policy and provides informed analysis to policymakers, administrators, and scientists. We have recently published studies on research integrity, open science, and different areas of biotechnology. EMBO is also publishing five journals. Next slides. And I'm sure you are familiar with uh, many of these journals. And as an uh, academic publisher, EMBO is uh, uh, pioneers publishing policies, including transparent peer review, scooping protection, and EMBO also encourages authors to publish source data together with their manuscripts. Next slide. Um, this is an overview of the programs that uh, Indian scientists are eligible to apply to. Uh, the program with the largest reach is probably the EMBO courses and workshops with 90 scientific meetings organized by experts annually. Next slide. Here you can see an overview of the uh, uh, meetings that were scheduled to take place in 2020 and highlighted are the six meetings that are scheduled, were scheduled to take place in India. They come in two flavors as practical courses and workshops. And more recently, together with the India Alliance, we have the India EMBO lecture courses, which is, are the topic of a seminar. Uh, next slide. Yeah, I'm supposed to remind you that travel grants and fee waivers are available to scientists from India to any of our courses. Next slide. Um, probably the largest program in terms of, of reach are the EMBO fellowships. They, uh, uh, they come in two flavors. There's the postdoctoral two-year fellowships, and there are the short-term fellowships, which, which are for a maximally three-month uh, exchange uh, for collaboration between scientists. These fellowships are a topic of another webinar, which is hosted on the India Bioscience web, uh, website, so you can learn more about that there. Next slide. Uh, no, please go back one slide. Um, I would just like to say a few words about uh, the EMBO lab leadership courses. As scientists, we are well trained in our specific research areas, but we are not being trained in how to lead a, a group of researchers. And um, we have, uh, in 2005, we uh, developed the lab leadership courses. Next slide, please. 
um, to address that issue. So in the lab leadership courses, you learn leadership skills, communication skills, team development, and conflict solving uh, strategies, among other things. As you can see, uh, initially uh, for this year, two courses were planned in India, again together with the India Alliance, which uh, uh, due to the current situation could not take place. But our trainers have now put this course online and uh, together with the India Alliance in the next couple of uh, months, we will be bringing these courses to India. So please watch this space, that is, watch the India Alliance space. You will hear about that. Uh, next slide. Um, one uh, Another activity that I would like to quickly mention because also of, of, of Indian involvement is the Embu Young Investigator Network. Next slide. The uh, MO Young Investigator program was launched in 2000 with the aim, aim to highlight some of the best young group leaders in Europe. And since 2016, our associate member states also uh, uh, take part in this. So it's a highly competitive program. And on the left, you can see those who have been selected from India. And uh, most, recent, um, uh, most recently, we're, we're being joined by Deborah Jyoti Chakraborty from New Delhi, who will be part of this program next year. Uh, from next year onwards. Next slide. The uh, Global Investigator Program was launched in 2019 um, to highlight some of the best group leaders in our EMBC associate member states. And on the left, you can see the Indian members. The two latest additions are Jusunil Laxman and Aravind Penmatsa, who will be joining the program in 29, uh, 2021. Again, both programs have been the subject of another webinar, which, is, which can be viewed at, uh, on the India Bioscience website. Next slide, please. So now we are coming to the uh, topic of, of today's webinar, which is the India Embo Lecture Courses. So these are not your usual scientific meeting. It is exclusively aimed at training young scientists. So it aims to teach background and underlying concepts on a particular topic in the life sciences to PhD students and postdocs. Next slide. The course should consist of scientific lectures by experts, and preferably the speakers would give a more general overview lecture as well as, a, as more specific research lectures. Poster sessions and student presentations are there to teach um, students and postdocs uh, presentation skills and discuss the own, their own research. And of course, extensive meet, meet the speaker sessions uh, uh, should be organized to allow students to talk to mentors and, and, and part other participants at the meeting. Ideally, we're looking uh, for uh, uh, additional uh, um, activities such as journal clubs, roundtable discussions, and tutorials that would allow uh, uh, that enhance the the um, networking and learning experiences of, of the young scientists. Next slide, please. Um, you might also want to consider uh, organizing special training sessions, and these are in particular funded again also by the India Alliance. And here, you, you know, just a few examples would be uh, uh, teachings on technologies that are relevant to the research area being covered in this course. Um, to teach them how to review man manuscripts, talk about career options, possibly also how to apply for postdoc and position postdoc positions and fellowships, talk about how to talk to members uh, of the society about science, uh, think about uh, discuss gender diversity, and maybe uh, provide some teaching on scientific writing and presentation skills or whatever else would be necessary to for for young scientists in India and of course also elsewhere. Um, next slide, please. We are looking for courses that have maximally 120 participants over a duration of four to ten days. Next slide. Um, and courses should be organized by a, a group of up to five co-organizers, uh, preferably they should be from different institutes, and again, an international grouping would be preferred. Uh, next slide, please. Um, um, for speakers, we look for a ratio of at least one to one to speakers to participant at, at least one to five, which means in a course where you allow 120 participants, at least 20 speakers to allow 
really strong interactions between teachers and, and participants. At least 40% of these should be based in Europe, and at least 30% of these should be from the underrepresented sex. Uh, EMBO does not allow any of, it, of its meetings to be uh, taught by one gender only. Next slide, please. In terms of funding, EMBO will pr provide uh, uh, base funding of 33,500 euros, which can be used to travel to, to cover the, the costs for the speakers, on-site catering for the meeting, admin costs, room hire, etc., accommodation for the participants, and social activities if planned. Um, the India Alliance funds will, travel, uh, will cover travel grants for participants, childcare support for speakers or participants where necessary, and the training workshops um, that I was mentioning earlier, if additional speakers and trainers need to be hired. Next slide, please. Applications are accepted uh, twice per year, 1st of March and 1st of August, uh, for courses taking place in the next calendar year. So, in 2021, applications are for courses taking place in 2022. And I think uh, with this, uh, I'd like to finish and invite our course organizers uh, to, to talk about their courses uh, to give you an example of what it is that uh, we, we're looking for. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Thank you for that uh, very helpful overview of EMBO activities and of the India EMBO lecture course. Um, so uh, may I now invite uh, Shubha Tole, uh, who recently received the award to organize an India EMBO lecture course to share her experience with the application process, any tips or advice she may have for those planning to apply this year. So over to you, Shubha. Sure, hello. Sorry, um, before I begin to uh, share screen and so on, I'd just like to, sorry, can you see my screen or me or what? Yes, yes, we can see your screen and we can uh, also hear you, Shubha. Okay, so I'll just talk first. Um, what I wanted to say was, uh, this, is a, uh, this is an EMBO India lecture course. Uh, it's to be expected that the majority of the participants who come will be Indian students and postdocs and perhaps uh, uh, faculty in the field. So one has to really think about who the target audience is and, uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. so it's one, one should think of who the target audience is and who one is doing it for. Um, in some sense, what so what we did, my co-organizers and me, Orly Reiner from the Weizmann and Carol Shermans from Sunnybrook Research Institute in Toronto, and Bhavna Murlidharan from INSTEM in Bangalore, a young faculty member just started her lab. So we had a range of experience amongst the organizers. We really wanted to not just do a regular meeting and kind of masquerade it as a EMBO India lecture course, because then you wouldn't meet the you wouldn't meet the requirements of the program. So we um, came from a place of thinking, how can we energize the Indian community of students and postdocs uh, in the very new field that we were going to, we, we had proposed our, our meeting, we were going to do a organoid centric meeting, organoids of every possible uh, um, structure, structure you could imagine. So this was our overall motivation. Uh, Given that Indian students and postdocs, if they've trained in India, they may have had limited exposure to issues that are actively discussed in the international community. We put in many, many sessions. The first of these I'll just talk about is uh, more of an academic training. We had two poster sessions, which usually meetings have, but we decided to have a one minute, one slide poster blitz for each of the, each, each and every single poster presenter would get a minute to showcase their work and say, hey, come and see my poster, I have this, you know, finding. Uh, and we would also give people training in how to do this. Uh, so in some sense, the mentorship of the community would begin even before the meeting itself. Uh, we have each attended meetings where there have been one minute blitz talks and they've been really successful. So we thought we would put this in. So this was sort of academic uh, training and mentorship, but we had many other goals that we wanted to hit. Uh, we decided that the prime slots, early evening, you know, when people are sort of willing to, uh, um, you know, discuss things that are outside of ex exactly the science, 
uh, but important to the science. We had training and mentorship in these prime slots. So uh, a proposed training and mentorship sessions in these prime slots. Uh, so one of them was a roundtable mentorship, mentorship session where we'd, we would have a pre-matched group based on subject area or interest in what they wanted to discuss, a mentor and five trainees around a table. And the topic of discussion discussion could range from many different things, but these tables would be pre-decided on what sort of space they wanted to discuss, uh, what it takes to have a successful PhD, how one chooses a postdoc, um, funding issues, job searches, two career couple issues, things that people may feel hesitant and not know whom to ask. We thought we would give the community of students and postdocs a forum to ask everything. And this material would be sent out beforehand, so nobody would think that any question is taboo. Um, managing family and work, how to relocate, work-life balance, even mental health, diversity, inclusion, everything would be on the table and uh, we would have these roundtable, uh, you know, sessions and a sumptuous amount of time given to them. So we didn't pack the program uh, with academic, uh, you know, seminars. We left enough time for all of these. Uh, the next was uh, two different events. One, a bioethics seminar, since the whole meeting was about organoids, so ethical issues involved therein, which is good for people to think about before they start such a thing. And then a broad ethics of science workshop, which I propose to offer myself. I've offered this particular workshop in uh, many fora. Um, and broadly, these are the things we cover. It's extremely interactive breakout sessions, talking about um, you know professional, personal issues, moving to another lab that works on a similar project, you know, maybe scooping your friend uh, from your previous lab, uh, authorship issues, how even one has these conversations, uh, sharing data, you know, what to reveal, what not to reveal. Uh, I, I find personally that students in India are very, very hesitant to even question these things and everything comes from one person, your, your advisor, and their limitations become your limitations. So we sought to open these uh, uh, areas out for discussion. And of course, the sort of necessary component of scientific ethics, plagiarism and proper citation. Um, then we thought we would have a symposium that focused on different aspects of career planning. It's no longer the case that, you know, everybody's students are expected to follow their own footsteps and, you know, you make more and more scientists. And if you don't want to run a lab of your own, you know, you're somehow uh, uh, less in any way. Uh, the idea that there are so many interesting things to do with one scientific training and we should make them all uh, 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 you know, flesh them out and discuss them and talk about how to begin to explore these. So this this uh, symposium would uh, devote itself to how, you know, what is a successful PhD, uh, how you choose a postdoc, how you aim your postdoc to whatever it is you want to do, um, whether you do a postdoc at all, work-life balance, uh, mental health, and a focus on women in science in India, which we believe is necessary. So with all of these packed into the, so, uh, the lecture program, we thought or we hoped that by the end of the meeting, we would have created a community amongst the participants, uh, one that will endure and we would have already a pre-built network, people who can feel comfortable talking with each other, they might collaborate uh, down the road. And uh, more, most important that having been through an exposure like this, they would try and pay it forward and bring these sorts of thought processes and ideas into whatever they organize down the road. And indeed in their um, sort of um, you know, research and functioning in science in the scientific community. And then finally, we decided to go a step further, that we're bringing all of these international speakers uh, to, to India, uh, for some of them maybe their first time. And certainly it's, it's, you know, it's difficult to get the funding to have all these people travel. So once they're in India, we would ask that, we would ask their permission beforehand if we can share their names and specializations with local institutions, at least. So we proposed to hold this meeting in Bangalore uh, in the NCBS in STEM uh, conference venue. NCBS being a, a center of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research where uh, I work in the Mumbai campus. So we thought at the very least we would share, uh, ask the speakers if they would like to give a few talks in Bangalore or then a short flight from Bangalore, other cities. How would they like to do a sort of speaking tour of various Indian institutions? And we would then make this matching, go a little bit further and make this matching available so that, um, you know, 
the, the, the funding that we would get to bring all these speakers here is maximized in terms of bang for buck and speaker engagement. And we find actually having informally done some of this uh, when we have visitors, that speakers are often very happy to travel and see a little bit of India, uh, not just in terms of tourism, but uh, science, Indian science in different institutions. So uh, this was sort of the package that we proposed. And uh, we are very, very uh, uh, delighted that we were uh, our proposal was selected for funding. And we really look forward to having the meeting, hopefully in person, COVID permitting, but time will tell. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shobha. That was very helpful, very, very useful pointers there. Um, with that, um, I just want to remind our audience that they can ask questions uh, anytime during this webinar by uh, typing in the questions box. Uh, so with that, uh, we, we have um, Stephen Pelpless, uh, who is the organizer of Feb's EMBO lecture course. Uh, Stephen, if I can invite you to please share your experience uh, with a different format of uh, lecture course in Europe and uh, what would be your tips and advice for applicants? Sure, just give me a second here. Um, can you confirm that you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Terrific. All right, yeah, thanks very much for including me here. Um, this is going to be a brief overview about what we had planned uh, for this year, actually, but it was postponed to 2022 due to the current COVID situation. So this was an EMBO Fabs lecture course that was on iron channels and transporters, so membrane proteins, essentially. Um, what I, I have to try to switch the slides here. Here we go. So a couple of the basics on the course. So it's set in Italy, and it's actually an old monastery on the, on the top of a mountain, and it means it's quite secluded. So it means that once the attendees are there, they almost have no uh, way to escape. Um, and this has actually been mentioned as one of the key features of this course, that it's really great. It's creating a great atmosphere. It's a tiny, ancient Italian city, and the, the speakers really get to interact with the students a lot because it's not like the speakers can just uh, walk off or drive off to some other location. So this has been really one of the key features of this course. And uh, this course has some history. So the course has uh, been hosted six times by EMBO since 2002. And it's quite the feature now. So there's quite a few very high profile spe speakers that uh, always uh, inquire about the ability or, you know, if, if they're allowed to participate the next time. So I just got an email request yesterday, actually, from a quite a famous scientist who asked if there was not a speaker slot left. So this is quite a reputation now, which is really nice. It attracts very good speakers usually. In terms of numbers, it's uh, it's roughly around what Gerdan said. We have about 22 invited speakers. Uh, there's three co-organizers and typically around 100 to 150 young scientists. Uh, this was the count from 2006. So there were about 80 from Europe, 17 from uh, US and Canada, six from Eastern Europe, and then uh, two from sort of Central and South America. So quite a, a mix of attendees actually. And um, it's quite a broad range of topics that we cover within this membrane protein uh, field. So we have a lot of structural biology because that's something that's very hot at the moment. There's a lot of uh, movement in that field. There's a lot of functional but also computational work. Um, and we really made an effort to also include some physiology and some medical aspects uh, on, on these particular proteins. So we, we really try to span a broad uh, a bandwidth of topics within this uh, sort of uh, general topic area. Now, there's two key features, and one of them has already kind of been mentioned, or both of them have kind of been mentioned. So first of all, uh, every speaker gives essentially two talks. Um, so there's one didact didactic lecture, and that should be sort of aimed at the postgraduate level, and it's to provide a broad background for the topic or the technique that is used in their research. And so this is really, you know, forming the basis. So this is, you know, get, making sure the audience understands the background to the second lecture, which is then sort of a cl more classic uh, scientific presentation on the cutting edge research that is going on in the laboratory of the speaker. And this format has actually been proven uh, very successful also for the uh, trainees because it's, it's very popular, because it makes sure that even uh, people from very diverse backgrounds uh, get the most out of every lecture. So it will essentially ensure that the participants who have very different backgrounds will be able to appreciate the principles and the approaches but also place the following scientific uh, lecture in broader context. So unlike a regular context uh, conference where you know sometimes 
especially younger trainees are quite easily lost in, in talks. This really makes sure that they that everybody's on board and understanding what uh, what this is about. And each of the lectures will be followed by a two, 10 minute question and answer session. And all speakers will deposit handout notes of their lectures onto a dedicated website. So actually all the trainees can have access to this uh, after the meeting. Now, the other thing is uh, that's quite important to this course is that we have tutorials and also to the extent that it's possible in this remote monastery is to have some hands-on ex exercises. So these will involve researchers meeting in small groups of students to discuss a specific area uh, of expertise in de greater depth. And these topics, they, they sort of rotate and they, they change a bit throughout the years. And the tutor will prepare an advanced structured points for conversation alongside uh, hands-on scientific exercises. And again, this depends a bit on what, um, what is possible that year. But I'll get back to these points uh, in a second. So these tutorials will center around key concepts of ion channels and transporters, as well as more general topics, such as, for example, how to communicate uh, science to the general public. But again, the topics, they depend a bit on, on the speakers also that we have. Um, and another important feature to us is to have really a couple of highlight lectures. In there. And one of them is obviously the EMBO keynote lecture, which in this case, for the next course, we were actually able to get uh, Professor Dame Frances Ashcroft from, from Oxford. Um, and she's really one of the preeminent uh, people in the field. And so she creates obviously a lot of pull for participants to actually sign up for this course. Then we were lucky enough to also have a very uh, accomplished speaker from the US, uh, in this case, as uh, the Ember Woman in Science lecture. And she will really um, also focus on sort of gender aspects in modern day science. Uh, and this, I think, is also a very important uh, component of this particular course. Now, the other thing is that we were very lucky to have a former uh, senior editor of Nature and then the, the editor in chief of Nature Communications, who will talk on uh, navigating the writing and publishing process. And this is really quite um, useful also to the trainees because it really focuses on how, how do you write and how do you publish and communicate your, your actual research. And, and, and again, we're very lucky that we have a very accomplished scientist here or communicator in this case also um, signed up for this particular course. Then uh, we had a Howard Hughes investigator who will talk about general career aspects. Um, and he calls this uh, talk contemplations on the life as a scientist, a uh, story of fun and pitfalls. And now this is because we had to move the, the, the lecture course by two years. He's actually the only person who will not be able to participate in 2022. Every other speaker has already uh, asked to be re-invited for the 2022 edition. Chris Miller cannot do that because he had retired already last year and he, we talked him out of retirement for 2020. But he said he cannot sell it to his wife to uh, go back into work in 2022. So that's the only reason why he won't be there. We will replace him with another speaker that's not confirmed, but uh, on, a, on a similar topic. And then the last uh, sort of uh, special lecture that we have is on more sort of industry academia collaborations, where we actually have a chief scientific officer from uh, a company that actually is providing equipment that is used throughout the field quite a bit. And she will talk uh, about, you know, how can these sort of more um, industry-based approaches also be uh, implemented in academia. So these are the five special lectures, and I just wanted to give you a brief example of two days that we have scheduled. So this was the schedule that we had made for this year, for 2020. And as you can see here in the highlight, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but you can see the highlight. There's sort of a, a, a session chair every time, and then there's a speaker. But what's important is that there's always a lecture, in this case on noise analysis, so this is sort of the background. And then there's a talk that's more specifically on a, on a specific uh, topic. That the lecturer will talk about but again it's very important that this initial lecture sets sort of the the, the baseline or the expectation or the background to the following uh, uh, scientific talk another thing that we have are these uh, which i briefly mentioned before these self-assembled workshops that are important um, part of the program and then we have uh, this is an example of another day where we have uh, similar to what Schubler mentioned we have these data blitz sessions which I think are very useful for the younger scientists to really be forced to put what they're working on in a very brief format and to really try to you know, have this sort of elevator pitch type uh, uh, experience to really sit, try to sell their story to an audience and attract uh, attention to what they're working on. 
And then we have a lot of time every evening uh, before and after dinner for mixer and poster sessions. And that's really another very important part of the course where we really put a lot of emphasis on a lot of time for interaction. And uh, from previous courses, we have the experience that uh, these mixer sessions tend to go well into the night. Um, where people really get to talk a lot uh, amongst themselves, but also between the uh, trainees and the speakers. And uh, that was it from my end. So that's the, the that was the, co the the poster for this year's course, and we'll use pretty much the same thing for the one in 2022. I'm happy to take any questions now or later. Thank you, thank you, Stefan. And uh, we'll bring you back during the question and answer session at the after Zoe's talk. Um, so thank you so much for sharing your experience of organizing these lecture courses My pleasure. in Europe. Uh, and uh, so yes, uh, next up, Zoe, uh, can I request you to please share uh, an overview of the selection process? You know, what kind of a criteria is taken into account by the selection committee when you're reviewing these uh, application for the Extra courses. So over to you. Great. So thank you. Uh, can you confirm whether you can see my screen and hear me? Yes. 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 We can see your screen and hear you and see you clearly. Okay. So thank you very much for this invitation to uh, discuss a little bit what goes on behind the scenes after you submit your application. I have to say that the previous speakers made an excellent job in uh, giving you an idea of what should go on before you submit your application. So uh, a lot of thought and uh, preparation uh, so that uh, we are able to see how you have um, organized this meeting and how it will be a maximal benefit for uh, the participants. Um, so who is going to be reading uh, your applications? Uh, these are the members of the EMBO Courses and Workshops uh, Committee. Um, so they are all EMBO members. As you can see, they come from different uh, countries who are uh, EMBO member states. Uh, and they also uh, come from, uh, they have expertise in different areas. Um, they um, uh, work on this committee to look at all the applications that are being submitted, both for this type of program, but also for the other courses and workshops uh, programs that EMBO uh, is funding. Um, so the first stage uh, is remote and two of these um, um, two members of this committee will read each application in depth and they will score uh, your application. Um, they will then um, transmit their scores to the EMBO office and if there is a disagreement, a significant disagreement between the scores, then they may discuss between them to, to reach a consensus or not, as the case may be, uh, on, what, uh, on each application. Uh, after this remote phase, uh, we have a committee meeting where we all get together to discuss every single one of the applications in depth. Um, we normally do this in Heidelberg, but uh, well, as everything, uh, next, um, uh, next, uh, the next um, uh, committee meeting will be done on Zoom. And um, so we will all get together and each application is being introduced by the two members who have read it in depth. And, and then it will be discussed by all committee members. Um, so what will we be discussing? Uh, so what are the se selection criteria? As I mentioned at the beginning, the, the major underlying criterion is maximal benefit for the participants, not for the organizers or for the speakers, but for the participants. This can take many forms and you have seen some examples, uh, uh, but we are not limited to what you can come up uh, to um, deliver maximal benefit uh, to your uh, audience. Uh, but we are looking for, for some things that uh, we'll be going through. So first we look for a topic which is timely and, and interesting. Uh, so something that things are happening and your audience will benefit from um, getting to know more this particular topic at this particular time. Um, uh, in other uh, meetings that we organize, it is important that this topic is not covered by other meetings. Uh, for uh, this program that we are discussing now, this is less important. Uh, unless it has become a, an established program, there are many um, earlier such meetings. And then, of course, you should not duplicate uh, 
the type of topic uh, that has been covered before. Uh, you should keep in mind that the audience for this type of, um, uh, of courses uh, are mostly PhD and postdocs located in India. So a course taking place, for example, in the States uh, will not really interfere at all uh, with your audience. Um, then the next thing is that this topic, which must be timely and interesting, uh, should be covered in sufficient depth and breadth. So you should cover uh, the interesting aspects enough. Um, and they sh it should be covered by world experts in this field. Uh, so you, uh, you should think of people that have really contributed significantly, uh, either for a long time or even just now, because they've had a very interesting paper that has really changed a lot of what we think on this field. Um, so it should be leaders in the field, but it should also be varied. So they should cover this topic uh, from multiple aspects. They should come from different countries. They shouldn't all be from India. They shouldn't all be from the States. They shouldn't all be from one particular country. So you should have also geographical representation. And Gerlind mentioned that 40% should be from um, EMBC member states. And uh, also gender representation. Um, uh, usually, we also want to see that uh, plenary lectures are, are given by participants. This is not the case here, but we do want to see that participants participate and not just attend. And um, so even though there may not be um, a plenary lectures selected from the audience, uh, there should be other activities, and this is what we judge when we talk about networking activities, there should be, for example, poster sessions, and they should not overlap with lunch or dinner or a, a, or a plenary session. They should be standalone and with sufficient time for people to, to be able to properly present their work. And, and there should be a, a variety of other activities. Uh, flash talks, for example, were mentioned where everybody very, very briefly within a minute presents their work. Uh, there could be roundtable discussions, there could be other networking activities such as, you know, a small excursion or uh, joint dinners, meet the speaker sessions, mentoring sessions, women in science sessions, interactive sessions where the audience will be able to really participate and not just attend uh, and get maximal benefit uh, from these world leading experts that um, are, uh, are uh, participating uh, in the meeting. Now the applications should be as complete as possible. Uh, so uh, we really do not want to judge ideas, but things which are already confirmed. Uh, and therefore your speaker list and your program should be finalized, uh, even down to the detail of when exactly people will speak, uh, all speakers confirmed. And uh, so because we want to see uh, that uh, they are put together uh, in a way that will really benefit your audience. Uh, when will the mentoring session be? Uh, when will the poster session be? And so on. So um, if I can just uh, uh, finish uh, with a few uh, tips uh, for a successful application. Um, first, start early uh, because the program must be finalized and all speakers must be confirmed. Uh, and because we do um, uh, want to see uh, that you've put some thought into how this uh, lecture course will provide maximal benefit, you need to start thinking about this early. There are two deadlines uh, each uh, year, um, and uh, you usually need a few months before uh, to properly plan um, your application. Uh, the organizing committee uh, must be balanced. This was very nicely mentioned uh, by the, uh, the first uh, presenter, uh, where uh, you saw that uh, balance doesn't uh, means from different places, from different uh, uh, possibly ages. Uh, international, if possible, is recommended. Uh, it's, it's not absolutely essential, but it would be good to have an international organizing committee uh, that is balanced. Speakers, as I said, must be really world experts uh, in their field, but again, they must be uh, balanced on topics, gender, age. Uh, we do not want to see uh, just one given group of speakers, but a balanced uh, speaker list. 
Uh, as I said, maximal benefit for participants, it's the underlying uh, criterion. So really think carefully about your uh, meet the world, how, how your participants will really properly meet the experts you have there, network between them and with the uh, presenters and acquire skills uh, that will go over and above to just listening uh, to some very good speakers uh, talk. So activities to facilitate this uh, networking, uh, do ask for advice and also uh, if you have an, uh, an application which is not successful, do ask for feedback uh, to the office. Uh, please note directly to the committee members as this uh, will be viewed as trying to influence um, uh, their judgment. Uh, but do ask for advice, especially uh, as this program is a new program and it may not be exactly clear uh, to everybody what is required to make a successful um, uh, lecture course. So that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. It's very helpful. Uh, can I request the speakers to uh, turn on their videos and uh, microphone and we'll take some questions from the audience. So, uh, Gurlin, the first question is for you and, and uh, uh, if you could perhaps uh, tell us a bit about the rabbit of these lecture courses. Can these courses cover uh, allied topics such as history of science or research or in other areas like uh, environmental health or epidemiological research? Um, so, if you could just uh, yes. shed some light on the rabbit. Okay, the remit is of course is, is the all the areas that are covered by EMBO. Um, so yeah, there was there was particularly mentioned epidemiology and environmental research, if I understand that correctly. That is so far as it is um, as it has a, a molecular perspective to it. So um, so so epidemiology as a as a as a science itself is probably not something that is within EMBO's remit. What would you say, Zoe, as chair of the committee? Um, yeah, I guess, um, yeah, I agree. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Shobha, and uh, I think it would also be great to hear from Stefan about uh, how can we make these lecture courses more welcoming for students and researchers who are not particularly comfortable speaking in English. Um, so, um, do you have any advice or any any reflections on this? You're on mute, Shobha. Thank you. This is actually a really good question. It's it's important uh, in a country like India, <coughs> where some of us are privileged enough to have education in English. Um, but even then, that doesn't necessarily mean we're trained in expressing ideas in English. Uh, okay. I think we need to put in these elements into the publicity of the lecture course in itself. We should be uh, going out of our way to say this course is for you. It's for you to uh, basically you know, internalize whatever it is that you can take from the course and use it to, you know, further yourself along your career path and we will help you. So we, sh you know, the, the goal should be phrased in a broad enough welcoming way that English and language should be the least of it. But actually, this is a very nice idea that there should be a blurb about, you know, language is no bar and uh, maybe even specific to maybe even prior uh, mentorship or training sessions in, you know, if you're worried about your one minute grid stop talk, uh, one of the organizers or, you know, a volunteer uh, will sit with you and help you, you know, street, sort of spruce it up uh, and help you get over that. But just the, the willingness to get over the hurdle is required in the, in the community. So everything we can do to motivate that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would agree. We don't have a specific, uh way to address that yet but i would also th hope that the the language should not be a, a deterrent basically it, it, it is i think also in europe it's well accepted that not everybody's perfect at english and that's perfectly fine so i think it's about encouraging people to go despite maybe not being perfect english that's perfectly fine great thank you and uh 
Uh, also, Shubha and Vasan, if you can um, help us uh, understand if, if you have, or rather, if you have any advice or tips for organizers based at state universities in India, how can they put in competitive applications for the lecture course? Vasan, would you like to start on that one? Would you please go ahead, Shubha, then I will add in. Uh, so, okay, not having been on the committee, I don't actually know what they look for. But I can um, uh, I can try and imagine what I would do if I were in a resource strapped state university. First, I would be upfront about the constraints. Okay, I think there is uh, firstly, you know, you wouldn't want to try and misrepresent your situation, and the committee is savvy people. There's no, you know, pulling the wool over people's eyes. Finally, you want to do something useful with the funds. You want to further science. You want to further discussion. So. Um, I think a state university, while acknowledging its constraints, should also play on its strengths. And its strengths in India are a fantastic reach to a population that is normally not reached. Fantastic access to students who would otherwise maybe hesitate, you know, to even apply to or may not be able to afford the registration fees for some, you know, international symposium and something or the other. Uh, the state university can actually reach uh, and otherwise, you know, really, really left out population. So if you play on your strengths and you say, look, this is what we can do, this is not done before, and be creative and brainstorm about how you can do it. Maybe before the course, you know, get people in two, three days before and give them, you know, grant writing sessions or or presentation sessions or, you know, amplify the thing saying, look, you know, you, you, you allow us to do the course as it is defined in terms of the science and so on, and we will do this much more. And that extra can be things that don't cost you a whole lot of money, but that will actually add value to finally, finally, uh, um, um, you know, uh, enriching the Indian student community, which is what we want. Sure, sure. Thanks, Shubha. Uh, was there any thoughts on how to encourage uh, oh, think, applications? Uh, Shubha, I think fantastic. I think you covered it. All I could say is probably some kind of a preparation ahead of this application where any kind of orientation in terms of you know, what needs to be done and some kind of a handholding probably will really help. Otherwise, whatever you uh, you said, I think really captures the key essence of how can we leverage the uniqueness of the state universities. If, if, if I could also add to this, um, yes. I think it would be very important that you then also look for other collaborators. So I mean, why not be, of course, be on a state, uh, you know, state university? That's one thing. But then get get collaborate, you know, get co-organizers in from other institutes because that will also broaden your horizon and will broaden your ability to get, uh, you know, the best speakers that you might want to have. And I think that is a very good. I mean, the as, as Shubha was pointing out, the advantages of a state university is the wide reach and and you know really teaching, uh, uh, you know, being being able to teach and. Uh, but but they should also then fortify that with getting uh, you know contacting other co-organizers that would help them in in getting the scientific excellence together. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, thank you. Yes, Shubha, please. Uh, you want you're you're yeah, muted. I'm just hearing comments. Just oh, I'm on mute. Again. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, just sort of sparked an idea. Um, is there a way of actively encouraging? researchers at the elite institutions in India to uh, partner with state universities and host the meeting there. Then the strengths of both get used. But if we can somehow encourage this, that if the meeting is hosted in a state university, then automatically the local region is there, right? And uh, a win-win situation. So maybe we can have some inducements of this kind, I don't know, put into your system. Yeah, great. Thank you. So on that note, uh, St Stephen, if you could tell us how how can an applicant identify a good co-organizer uh, for the lecture courses? What would be your advice? Well, I this is my first organizing my first course, so I, I can maybe not speak to that so much. But I, it was definitely um, I, I was contacted by two pre by three previous organizers. And they mm -hmm. were very cognizant of actually trying to cover a broad international representation. It just happens to be that all the organizers right now are actually from Europe originally, but they are actually based now around the world. 
Um, we actually also we are a bit we're not doing so well in terms of gender balance on the organizing committee because we had a female member who had to drop out for personal reasons. But I think you know it it is a the the, the criteria that came into this were basically region like uh, lo, lo, localization where where people were. Mm -hmm. uh, to some degree, also career stage, but also uh, background. That was very important to make sure that uh, we're not all from the same sort of scientific background um, or subfield, uh, so as to ensure that every subfield within the greater field would get some representation. Um, because ultimately, when recruiting the, the speakers, it's very important that people know the, the best people in the field, and it makes it so much easier to attract the best people if you know people are personally acquainted or know of the people that do the good work there and so i think it's it's about a, a, a sort of balanced representation in terms of where people are based in terms of the field and obviously also in terms of gender if, if, if at all possible maybe it's also a good idea to go to conferences and just talk to to other scientists in the same you know in, in the same area and and ask them if they would be willing to join you on this and i know talking about con at conferences now is a bit difficult but nevertheless we have also a lot of online meetings so um you know you know just don't be too shy about it yeah and i mean uh, sorry just to chime in on this so that was the way i was uh, roped into this basically i was contacted at a conference by a previous organizer and uh, mm -hmm. we basically sat down with a bunch of people and you know we we shot back and forth some ideas and and you know we talked about what is feasible who has time and so it actually was quite a, an interesting process and it was quite open you know it was not like a secretive uh, thing where somebody asked somebody behind a back door or something it was just like an open question basically who would like to contribute and there were actually there was quite a bit of interest in the field because it's actually, I mean, it's great fun. I mean, you shouldn't underestimate the fun and uh, being able to put the best speakers in the field together and organize a great uh, sort of venue for young people to train. So I think it's it's actually, it's, it's a terrific uh, experience. So I can only encourage people to, to try it. Hey, thank I, you. Sorry, yes, if I can uh, yes. add on this topic, uh, that yes. actually, as Stephen said, it is very good fun. So uh, people are actually willing to be organizers. So I would simply to email, even if there are no meetings now to with organizers, find people who you think, I mean, choose your topic and then find people who are really well known or uh, very good in this field and just email them. And you would be surprised. I think many people would be very happy to organize a meeting uh, in India with you uh, on a topic that they really love to do. And and so, yeah, I think it, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be difficult to find very good organizers. Okay, great. Thank you, Zoe. And so, on the topic of topics, uh, if uh, there's a question that uh, how does the committee assess that a topic that has been covered in US or Europe is going to be new for India uh, for Indian researchers? Uh, how do you how do you judge that whether a topic is of relevance or or, or not for a, for India? Yes. So if I can answer, um, so we don't really, for these types of lecture courses, uh, we will not analyze uh, uh, parallel meetings that take place, for instance, a course in the US or a course in Europe, because your audience is different. Uh, mm -hmm. So you need to worry uh, about this type of overlap. Now, if there was an India, uh, if there was a similar course in India on a similar topic, then of course, this is not a good idea, right? You should pick a new uh, to try to organize. So things that are close in uh, space and time uh, are what would uh, negatively impact uh, the topic choice, right? Right. Um, so we have, uh, uh, Colin, uh, there's a question on how can one participate in these workshops and lecture courses as a PhD student? Is there any fee for participation? Uh, yes, I mean, basically you have to apply. There is an application uh, registration fee. Um, as I said, or as, yeah, as we both said, uh, the um, India Alliance does offer application fee waivers and, and travel grants for participants from India. So that should not be, you know, you just have to ask 
to get them. Also for uh, courses and workshops in Europe or the rest of the world that we organize, again, there are travel travel grants and fee waivers available for scientists from India. So just apply and apply for uh, a travel grant or fee waiver. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so, if I can, uh, Zoe, is there anything Sorry. you want to? Yeah, if I can uh, add, uh, actually, for uh, also for the meetings that take place in Europe, as Gerlin says, there are travel grants which are name tagged for people from uh, India, and they are many times they are not used. So I've organized meetings before where we didn't have enough Indian participants to apply for the funds, right? Uh, so please do apply to European meetings and apply for the funding and you may very well get uh, selected. Great, uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Gurland, any final words from you uh, for uh, the potential applicants of the India Ambo Lecture courses? Any final words from Watson uh, before we wrap up? Well, final words, of course, we would, uh, I would love to see applications, strong applications, more strong applications coming in from India. If you have uh, examples, you can, I'm sure uh, Shiva would be willing to be contacted and advise you on that. Um, you could also look at her, her organizer board, uh, et cetera, ask them what they're doing, look at uh, lecture courses that are already taking place for inspiration in terms of how to organize your programs. So as final words, love to see strong applications next year for lecture courses in India in 2022. Great, thank you. Uh, Vasan, any final words from you? Yeah. yeah, please, please, we really expect uh, more and more uh, applications for the next round and we have a lot of resources and all of us in this panel are reachable via email and do we have our portals where people can go back and look at how enriching this exercises can be and we are here to help out we really look forward to getting more applications thank you uh, we have one final poll just to see the number of applications we can expect this year or, or next uh, so can i request my colleagues to launch the poll please Great, so looks like we will be getting quite a few applications this year and, and, and next year too. Speaker, important pointers and experiences with us, with our audience. Uh, thank you very much uh, to, to our participants for joining this webinar. Um, I think I should mention here and reiterate that we need your support and active participation uh, to make India Embo Electric Courses a successful program in uh, and, and finally, you will be redirected to the survey page as we end this session. So I request you all to please provide your valuable feedback to us. India Ambo Lecture Courses, and in case you have any queries that we were not able to respond to during this web, please uh, send us an email. Uh, so with that, um, I wish you all very good health. Please take good care and stay safe and uh, hope to uh, stay in touch with all of you. Thank you once again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.